Well, it looks like we're live now. We're going to have a pretty intense little study today. I'm going to go ahead and get started immediately. It's, a, it's going to be a longer study about the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. So here's a question. You know, what does the Bible say that Jesus is going to look like at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Exactly when will it take place? And will you and I be a part of it? So we're going to answer some of those today. Uh, we're going to start out with the book of Revelation Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, write this. Now, it must have been very important for God to say, write this. He wanted to accent this. He said, this is something you don't want to miss. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God Revelation 19 9. So the book of Revelation gives us many wondrous glimpses into the future. In fact, uh, hi Victoria, it's full of images that, that chill and terrify and also up to uplift and give great hope to those in their faith in Jesus Christ. So the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the Apostle John wrote down everything shown to him through the visions while he lived in exile on the Isle of Patmos. One of those visions was the greatest wedding feast to ever occur, known as the wedding supper of, or the married supper, married supper, wedding supper uh, of the Lamb. Hi, Catherine. It's so good to see you. And so I think you'll know, find, I'm going to go pretty fast, and there's a lot of information here. I hope to get through it in one session. If not, we'll do a part two. But listen, this is something for you and I to look forward to. But the question is, are you really going to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb? Uh, so Revelation 19, 9 again. And the angel said to me, write this. Now circle that. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So the feast that will take place when all the church often compared to as the bride of Christ, has been taken up to what we normally generalize a location called heaven, uh, with everyone united with their Savior, the bridegroom. So in this vision, and I won't read it, but Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 10, John saw and heard the heavenly multitudes praising God because of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Literally, the marriage supper was about to begin. The concept of the marriage uh, supper is better understood in light of the wedding customs uh, of during the times of Jesus Christ, the Jewish customs. So these wedding customs had three major parts. First of all, a marriage contract was signed by the parents of the bride and the bridegroom. And the parents of the bridegroom or the bridegroom himself would pay what is known as a dowry or a down payment to the bride of her parents. Did you get that? There was a price to be paid. This began what was called the betrothal period what we would today call the engagement. Hi, Catherine Griffith, so good to see you, and James. And uh, so this is what we call the betrothal period, and uh, or the engagement. This period was the one Joseph and Mary were in when she was found to be with child in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and Luke chapter 2, verse 5. So we know the first step was what? We know it was to give a dowry, sign a contract, and say, I'm going to marry this person, all right? And uh, the second step in the process usually occurred much later. And that was when the bridegroom, accompanied by his male friends, went to the house of the bride. He would come in the night. He and his companions would create a torchlight parade through the streets, and the bride would know in advance this was going to take place. And she would be ready with her maidens, and they would all join the parade and end up at the bridegroom's home. Now, this custom is the basis of the parable of the ten virgins 
in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Now, the third phrase was the Mary Supper itself, uh, which might go on for days, might go on for weeks, as illustrated by the wedding at Canaan in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Now, what John's vision in Revelation pictures is the wedding feast of the Lamb. I want you to think about that. The Lamb, which, of course, we know is Jesus Christ, so when Jesus shows up at the wedding feast, they're going to know that he was the Lamb of God and that the church is the bride of God. This is the third phase. So the implication is that the first two phases have already taken place. The first phase was completed on earth when each individual uh, believer placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Phase number one. So the contract with the father has been made. All right. The dowry paid by the bridegroom's parent. God the father would be the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, uh, on their behalf. So the church uh, on Earth Day, they call it Earth Day today, then is betrothed to Christ and like the wise virgins in the parable, all believers should be watching and waiting for the appearing of the bridegroom and that's going to happen at the rapture. We're right there. It could happen before we even finish this sermon. So the second phrase symbolizes the rapture of the church when Christ comes to claim his bride and take her to his father's house. John 14, 1 through 6, right? And so here we have the, the final step. Uh, uh, and the Mary Supper uh, then follows as the third and final step is our view that the Mary Supper of the Lamb takes place in heaven between the rapture and the second coming during the seven-year tribulation that's on the earth. So attending the wedding feast will not only uh, well, not only the church as the bride of Christ, but others as well. Notice the word others. It, that includes those in the Old Testament saints. They will not have been resurrected yet, but their souls and their spirits will have already been in heaven with us. And as the angel told John to write in Revelation 19.9, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of of the Lamb. And so the Mary Supper of the Lamb is a glorious celebration of for all who are in Christ Jesus. And like many verses and images and chapters dealing with this prophecy in the future and the events that take place when the world ends, understanding the significance, the significance of the Mary Supper, it can be difficult for some. Sometimes it requires studying, cross-referencing some other books in the Bible. So in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and, and severed their relationship between humanity and God. And the sin meant unholy individuals could not stand before their holy God uh, without the, having an atonement for their sins. Did you get that? And so by faith, many through the centuries came to have a relationship with the Lord. And after the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, man now has a direct access to God through Christ. And no longer is there a needed a sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Uh, just sincere repentance. Now let me explain that to you, okay? God, I am a sinner, and I have broken your heart. I, I, I can't even be in your presence, and I'm sorry, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And with that, we're pointed to Jesus Christ, who bore our sin debt on the cross, paid an awful price for you and I, and, uh, and then on the third day after being buried and dead, he arose, went to the Father, applied the atonement of the blood, and then he came back 
And for over 50 days, he walked on this earth. And over 500 people saw him at one time. So by faith, many through the centuries came to have a relationship with their Lord and after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because now they know they have access to God and no longer need to go out and, and have a sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Uh, but those who love the Lord, we want to be reunited with him. I have a problem today when people don't that say they're saved, but they don't even think about, hey, today could be that day. Today could be the day of the rapture. Today could be the day when we're, we're just whisked out of here. First Thessalonians chapter four talks about that. But the wedding supper or the marriage supper, depending on the translation, it is a celebration that will occur sometime during the end of days. I just preached a couple of weeks ago about the end of days. You don't want to be here on this earth during the end of days. Go back and listen to that message and share it with people. But, uh, but the marriage supper of the Lamb is a celebration that's going to occur sometime during the end of days. And when those who will spend eternity in what you and I like to refer to as heaven with Jesus Christ, what are we doing? We are celebrating being forever united with Jesus, our Savior. It's all about Jesus, folks. It's not about a supper. It's not really about a heaven. It's about being with Jesus Christ. And the believers are symbolic by the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. Now, after centuries, all of heaven will celebrate Jesus, everyone uh, that died, uh, that he died for to save them. They are now living together in his rightful reign over all the earth. So Jesus and his true believers are now united. This is a love fest. I want you to write that down. It's a love fest. We're in love with Jesus. Jesus is in love with us. And for the first time, we get to meet face to face. So this is exciting. So it is a moment of excitement, one that even the Lord Jesus Christ, he's looking forward to it. And as many religious scholars believe that it's the, uh, the event referred to when Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 29, listen, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the Lord's Supper is believed uh, to be uh, uh, served as a dual purpose, not only of remembering the sacrifices of Jesus Christ, but also looking forward to that event when we're going to be together and we're going to see him eye to eye and we're going to be able to, to walk up to him and give him a hug and, and just love on him and he's going to love on us back. But the description of the great wedding feast comes toward the end of a series of visions given to the Apostle John about the last days. And we can read about it. Go ahead and turn to Revelation 18. So the evil city of Babylon rose to prominence during the, it's going to rise to prominence during the tribulation period. And as documented in the previous chapters, in chapter 18, which we're going to look at, it finally succumbs to, right, to rightful judgment what everyone who loved, profited from, and worshiped Babylon is now going to mourn. The angel declares in, in Revelation 18, verse 21, and also all the way down to 23 and 24. Let me read this to you. It says, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And, her, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been slain on earth. So then it picks up in chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Revelation picks up with the, uh, uh, with the great reaction that's going on in heaven. The rejoicing, the praising of God because of his goodness, his righteousness, and, and, and the collapse of all evil. The next vision is that of the Mary Supper of the Lamb. John sees all the saints. Turn to Revelation 19, verse 6. John sees all the saints and the, and the souls that are residing in heaven saying this, 
Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and, and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. I want you to underline that. Has made herself ready and it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. We're about to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, folks. We're going to clean up some things in our minds, our hearts, and our lives. We are a bride. Uh, so following the invitation of the saints to the Mary Supper of the Lamb, John moves on to the next vision of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. And the bridegroom is riding on a white horse, coming to assert his dominion, finally defeating all of his enemies, the beast and the false prophets, uh, and begin what is known as the 1,000 millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So we've got the rapture, we got seven years of tribulation, we got the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then once he sets himself of his rule on this earth, it'll be a 1,000 year reign. Now, uh, following the invitation of the saints to the Mary Supper, uh, John had moved to this next vision, which is that of the millennial reign. And this period of time covers a thousand years where Jesus will reign on earth as king on the earth for 1,000 years and we're going to reign with him. And while the devil's bound and unable to deceive, uh, it is discussed in Revelation chapter 20. So we don't have time to go back and read all these verses, but just jot down and go back and look for yourself. So a lot of theologians debate when the Mary Supper of the Lamb is going to take place on the timeline of events. They generally agree of its significance as one of the key moments in God's plan. It is a celebration of faith that is made sight, reunions fulfilled, promises fulfilled. So throughout the New Testament, the joy of the believer being united with the Savior Jesus forever is compared to the joy of a bride and a bridegroom celebrating and starting their new life together. It's a lasting union meant to be the source of joy as those in the relationship grow closer and closer to one another. So we know that the Jewish tradition of the betrothal and the marriage, as well as the modern one, it foreshadows this future feast, the Merry Supper of the Lamb. So a young man became betrothed through a contract to a young lady, which today is similar to the engagement period. And when the individuals get saved, they join uh, 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 the brethren, they join the church, and, and are metaphorically, they're betrothed, engaged to Jesus Christ. And a year after the betrothal, uh, the bridegroom returns for the official ceremony and took his bride into his home like today's wedding ceremonies, all right? And Jesus, one day Jesus will return, this is important, for his church, the true church, and call them to him and take them to his home. And just like today, there is a reception party. Uh, Jewish custom had a large celebration which will be fulfilled at the prophesied feast is the Mary Supper of the Lamb. And after the Mary Supper, the church will have eternity to live with God. And the primary purpose of that illustration of the bride and the bridegroom, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 57. Listen carefully. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, circle that word splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We're going to be the perfect bride for the perfect Savior. In John chapter 14, verse 3, he said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and, to, and I will take you to myself, and that where, that where I am, there you may be also. See, all this is based on Jewish custom, and Jesus is following to the team. 
Now, we're not going to read it, but Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, it's the parable of the ten virgins. And there are many details about the last days that are a mystery and hidden from view. But God provided a general outline so that sinners can repent before it's too late. And believers can have a glimpse of their future with Jesus Christ. So when times are tough for believers, knowing that God will keep his promises and some of the wondrous events to come are going to be there to encourage us. What a time that's going to be. I'm telling you, if you're excited about that, give me, give me a thumbs up. Amen. And uh, But for those who do not know if they are invited to attend the Mary Supper, that there is a time to go to Jesus to do what? To repent and have their faith placed in Jesus Christ so their name can be written in the Lamb's book of life. And they're just like the thief on the cross where he said, today thou will be with me in paradise. So now faith is the assurance, the Bible says, of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of the old received this commandment. So in Hebrews chapter 11, remember I said I'm not going to read these verses, all of them, but that's not will. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are what? Invisible. So God wants everyone to celebrate at the celebration and calling those who do not know him yet to take the step to accept his invitation. So the Mary Supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19, 9, and he said to me, right, blessed are they which are called, called unto the Mary Supper of the Lamb. You see, uh, you will perceive that there was an exhortation to John and the word is right, W-R-I-T-E. Why? Did he say, right? Remember, we talked about that at the beginning of the message. What was, he especially wanted to write down these words. Uh, it, I can see that it was, first of all, because the information here recorded was valuable. Valuable. Blessed are they which are called under the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's valuable information, folks. It has nothing to do with religion. Doesn't have to do anything to do with uh, you know who you're related to. Has everything to do with the fact that you look to the Father and realize you're a sinner. You can't be in His presence, and you're going to be condemned forever. But then you look to Jesus as your Savior, and the blood that was shed was the atonement, the covenant. Go back and read Revelation one and two. Oh my gosh! It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we are saved and we are cleansed, and our name is written in the in the in the Lamb's book of life which means that our name will remain in the book of life. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. If that don't get you excited, you probably need to get saved. Amen. And so blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now I know, just like you do, that, that a lot of times people don't understand the significance of some of the wording in the Bible, like write it. I want you to write this down. And, uh, and he said this, he said, Didst thou bid the beloved disciple write it? And dost thou not therefore virtually bid me consider it and remember it? Notice that, remember it, question mark. Lord, by thy spirit, write the message on my heart. Blessed are they which are called of the merry supper of the Lamb. That all be written on your heart. I find that my text succeeded as well as preceded by something remarkable he said unto me, did you get that? God said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. That's remarkable. We ought to pay attention to this. We ought to be excited and be looking forward to the Mary Supper of the Lamb. But, you know, what's Jesus going to look like when we get there? Bible tells us. Uh, what are we going to do? The uh, Bible tells us. So some things appear to be good, too, too good to be true, I know, but we frequently m meet with sinners until a sense of guilt who are staggered by the greatness and the mercy and the holiness of Almighty God. The light of the gospel has been too bright for them, and so they, they shield themselves from the gospel. They hide in their own darkness, and, and, and Paul says, 
could not see the glory of that light. So as Paul said in describing the appearance of Christ to him when he was on the road to Damascus, uh, he said to make assurance doubly sure. Do you get that? Make the but to make assurance. There's the word doubly sure. You better make sure, really sure, that you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and that your name is written in the Lamb's book of God. He said, these are the true sayings of God. And, he, and Paul said, oh, sirs, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will come again and, and we will be gathered together as his people to make them forever blessed. And happy will you be if you're among the chosen company if you are, shall meet the king of kings with a joyful confidence, ye shall be blessed indeed. So you notice that I read two parts of two chapters before I came to my text, and I did it for this purpose. Because number one, the false harlot church is to be judged. Number two, the true church of Jesus Christ is to be acknowledged, it is to be honored, and it is to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the false must be put away before the true can shine out in all of its luster so that Christ would soon appear to drive the falsehood that was on our earth that was brought out by the false church. He said, I'm going to drive that off the face of the earth. At present, it seems that to gather strength and to spread till the darkness of the skies and, and, the, and, and then the sun turns into darkness, the moon into blood and all the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Oh, that the Lord would arise and sweep away all the deadly errors which now pollute the air. We talked about that when, during the tribulation period. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the greenery is going to be gone and a lot of the things that produced oxygen. Can you imagine living at less than, uh, I mean, 60% of your oxygen is gone. You're living at 40%. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? And the hunger. And we talked about that. But here we're talking about the, uh, the, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So if you're saved by the blood of Christ, you've asked Jesus into your heart, that he has made us, give us a way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we go through Jesus. He gets us to the Father, and we don't have to go through the, you know, the, the tribulation period. And we're going to be already there with him, celebrating the presence of God in our life and in his life. So he says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace for our eyes have seen thy salvation. Did you get that? Whether we live till Christ comes again or whether we fall asleep in him, we die, many of us know that we shall sit at the great wedding feast in the end of the days and we shall partake of the supper of the Lamb in the day of his joy and of his glory. And we're looking across the blackness and the darkness of the centuries into that promised millennial age wherein we shall rejoice with our Lord and, and have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now I want you to notice this right here. I, I, I will, I'm not going to delay point number one, the description of the bridegroom. What's Jesus going to look like? There is no marriage without a bridegroom. There is no marriage of a church without the appearance of Christ, and therefore he must be made visible or manifest. Well, watch what it says. He must come out from the ivory palaces that he's at, and, he's, and, and, the, and the, the throne where he's sitting right now, and he's going to come and get us and take us back there. But watch this right here. He said, Blessed are they which are called unto the merry supper of the what? The Lamb. So what's Jesus going to look like? He's going to look like somebody who paid for my sin debt and your sin debt. So the term the lamb seems to be the special name of Christ. And John was accustomed to using it. I suppose he heard it first from the other John called John the Baptist when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah had compared the Christ to a lamb bought, uh, brought to the slaughter. And he says, but he had not really called him 
the Lamb of God, the beloved John who knew the Master better than anyone else did, seemed to love constantly to call him by his most expressive name, the Lamb of God. God. Now, if the book of the Bible we read have expected that our, our Lord will not have been called the Lamb, it would have been the book of Revelation, right? But I might seem, as it says here, that he's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Might appropriately have been used every time. But the name of the Lamb has been dropped over and over and over in the writings, even in the book of Revelation. The name Lamb, the Lamb, seems suitable for Jesus. And uh, here below, he was despised, rejected of men, led to the slaughter, dumb and patient beneath the hands of cruel men. But the name, the Lamb, seems suitable for Gethsemane, Gabbatha, Galgotha. But John calls the Savior by this name, this name. He's the Lamb of God. And we ought to shout out from time to time, Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. And get that mindset going. He writes constantly, John does, about the Lamb, the, the, the Lamb in the midst of the throne, the Lamb leading his people to living fountains of water. And now the angel tells him to write about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the most remarkable because at first sight, it may seem uh, uh, incongruous to blend those two together, but the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb do go together. But we find that sometimes it happens when the language becomes a burden uh, for some people and they kind of get all messed up with it. But I want to keep it simple today. So it happens that the comparisons, the metaphors, crack and break like rotten wood in the wind under the trees of some of the great masters that thought which rules the, the writer's hand. What does that mean? It matters not whether it's congruous in being figurative, but it is congruous enough in the fact that the wedding at the last should be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you get that? Can you see why Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God? So here, here we find here that he desires to be viewed. Jesus desires to be viewed by us in his character. His character, a Lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world. This is the character which he now lays aside. And he, and he is the lamb that, that he, that's going to be manifested himself in this uh, consummation of all the things known when the church is perfected and then they're placed in the very presence. So the bride and the bridegroom are, are together. And so first is the lamb. And he's the one that's everlasting. He's the everlasting sacrifice for sin, where it is the lamb that God has provided. He was the final burnt offering. And it is Jesus, where in the morning and the evening lamb to take away Israel's guilt. It's Jesus. So where's the lamb that bleeds and dies? And, and that, that is that's the blood of the intel and the two side posts uh, may be smeared to secure the, the inmates of the house from destroying Egypt. Remember that? It was the blood of the what? The lamb that was put on the doorpost and the lintel above. And so in this whole life and in his death, he was no lion. He was no beast of prey, but he was gentle, suffering, sacrificial. He was a victim dying that, uh, that we may not die, presenting himself as a sacrifice acceptable unto God so that we can be made acceptable unto God. Now, because Christ was the lamb, he was suffering for sin. And because he delights to be remembered that he was our sacrifice, therefore he is seen in the capacity of the day of what's known as the gladness of heart, of his heart. He links the memory of the grief with the manifestation of the glory. And as he was a lamb to be redeemed for the church, he so does he appear as a lamb, notice, in the merry supper of the lamb, the merry supper of his glory. And one reason why he does this is because he's 
especially glorious in his character as the Lamb of God. He says, I want you to remember, I'm the Savior. I'm the Lamb of God. And, and that's because you're here. It's because of what I did for you. And so I cannot conceive our Lord Jesus Christ as even being less than being infinitely glorious beyond our own imaginations. But dear friends, if there was ever a time that we could appreciate the splendor of his character more fully at any other time, it was when he was on the cross and when he died and he arose and now then he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And then when the rapture takes place, we're taken out, and I believe that's where we have to give an account for our lives. We're rewarded with crowns that we can lay at his feet, but then we're going to celebrate at that table. And seven years later, Christ is coming back during the, uh, 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 the return of Jesus, and in that glorious event, event at, uh, we know as uh, Armageddon, and he's going to win. And yet he's going to set himself up. The devil's going to be thrown in, into the bottomless pit, and, uh, and he'll be there for several years, but uh, Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. And after that, the devil's going to be released for a little while to tempt man once again. But then Jesus says, time is no more, and it's over with. All of hell will be brought out of hell, and they'll go to the great white throne judgment, where they'll be judged of God you know, for their lives. And because they're not under the blood of Jesus, they're held accountable for each and every thought, each and every sin. And then they'll spend eternity in agony and pain, the Bible says. But we want you to understand, the Bible says this, but greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ laid down his life for you. He did it for, if you were the only one, if I was the only sinner, he'd have done the same thing just like he did for me and for you. I guess the question is, do you know for sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? When Christ laid down his life, he also laid it down for his enemies. Do you get that? When the Lord Jesus Christ put on that bloody shirt in Gethsemane, when he beckoned uh, himself with the five bright uh, rubies of his, of his wounds, when he was adorned with the crown of thorns, and last of all, when he was decorated with the robe of blood as the, as the soldiers pierced his side, then it was, that's when he was more illustratious than, than at any time before since the eyes of those who think upon him. There's the Lamb of God that's dying and shedding his blood for me. You see, I, I believe that, that we need to understand that we're getting close to the end days. Well, what if you die today? Are you ready? Are you ready? You see, beloved, the Mary Supper is known as the Feast of Love. I want you to write that down. It's the Feast of Love. Their love uh, is, is all taken care of when they're at home. So Jesus, that he may reveal himself to his loved ones, his best of alls, and appears to them as a bleeding sacrifice on that day as his love triumphs. You know, we're going to see Jesus in a way that, that it's going to finally hit home. It's really going to hit home what he went through on the cross of Calvary, and we're going to pay attention to that. So it, 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 uh, we have to understand there, there is one other thought that I'd like to give you. It is a lamb that Christ is best loved uh, uh, of our of our souls. What does that mean? It is a lamb that Christ is best loved for our souls. So we let me get readjusted here just a little bit. Perfect. All right. And so uh, we understand that because this is not only the feast of love, it's also going to be the feast of being home with the groom. And so at any rate, uh, you, you feel the affections that, that would draw you out unto him, the one who suffered in your stead. Tell him you know, that you know him most and you loved him the best. And, and maybe that's not so for some of us. Some of us may not even listen to the name of Jesus or speak out, I want to talk to the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that deserves all praise and worship and glory for covering me with his blood and, and covering my sins so that I can be in the presence of a holy God. He, he, you see, Jesus won my heart. 
And now he's completely mastered me. So I must love him now. I need to think of him. I need to be living for Jesus Christ. It's not how many people you have in your church. It's about how many people got out of that service and was burdened for the loss and they went out and with their Bibles, maybe before they even ate, and they knocked a few doors and they witnessed, they passed out a few tracks. It's not how many is in your church, it's how many in your church is out living for Jesus. And that includes you. That includes me. And as long as I have this tongue that I can move and these lips that I can speak, I'm going to preach nothing to you but Jesus Christ and him crucified that he and he alone who knew no sin was made sin for all of us that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, I know no Savior but Jesus Christ. Now, listen carefully. Who his own self bore, that's what the Bible says, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And who, when he had by himself purged our sins, it says he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And now the glory bears the marks of the great uh, propitiation by which these people are saved. So we know that, number one, uh, I had to speak on, on this because of the marriage supper of the Lamb, but the meaning of the marriage supper. He says, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. What will the marriage supper be? We would ask, right? There will come a time when all of God's redeemed shall be saved with Christ. There will come a day when all who have died shall have been raised again from the tombs and those who remain alive shall have been changed and caught up in the air. And so ever shall we be with the Lord. So that the corruption shall have put on incorruption. Mortality has put on immortality, the Bible says. Then will the church be perfect. Then will the church be complete. No member will be missing. There will be no spot or wrinkle remaining on me or you. Then it shall come to pass that Christ will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb in which he will be uh, bringing the people of God into the closest and happiest reunion you could ever imagine with Christ the Lord of their glory. Man, doesn't this get good? Down here in the South, we just say good or good or good or right. <laughs> then will the church be made perfect and the church will be made complete. All right. So even now, the Lord Jesus Christ is no stranger to some of us and we're not strangers to him. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Yet there shall come a day when we shall see him face to face and then we shall know him with a more clear and more fuller knowledge than what we could possibly know today. Oh, he paid the price. He paid the price for my sins, all of them. He paid the price for your sins, all of them. He paid the price for his enemies, all of them. Are you getting this today? What a bliss. What a day that's going to be. What a celebration. Unspeakable joy. The feast will be like the most like most other marriages you think of, but the fulfillment of this is long expecting. So the Bible says the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, listen, has made herself ready. Are you making yourself ready? Well, preacher, I go to church. I didn't ask you that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm Jewish. I'm the, I didn't ask you that. I asked you a simple question. As a child of God, are you making yourself ready to meet your groom in heaven and celebrate with all of the glories and the joy that, but knowing that he died for you, he rose again. And through that death and burial resurrection, that the price was paid. And so this is a mutual love, a mutual union. And the Bible says, then shall the righteous shine forth. Here it is. Woo! as the son in the kingdom of their father. Let me read that again. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the son in the kingdom of their father. And then shall the Christ himself also be manifested, uh, though he was forever, it seems like, forhidden from us. But now we see 
face to face. What a day that's going to be when the redeemed are all there. We can rejoice and rejoice and rejoice. We all start practicing that today. What hallelujahs will they raise to him? And what delight will, will he look upon his people and see them neither spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing because the blood has cleansed them and the spirit has perfected them and sanctified them. In the of the old, it was written in this. It says this: "The Lord of thy God in the midst of this is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over them that joy. He will rest in his love, and he will joy over thee with singing." Can you imagine that God singing over us? But what will the rest of love be? And what that singing of the Christ over the blood brought ones will be when they all are before him and all have been made like unto himself and they reflect the very glory of almighty God. Down here, it's always my prayer, Lord. I want to make sure that I, that I, that I bring glory and honor to your holy name. And yet up there, we're going to see the glory and the honor as it really is before a holy God. What a day that's going to be. And we talk about the persons who are called to the supper. Whosoever will, it says in Revelation, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the, the call, the behold, the bridegroom cometh to the foolish virgins as well as to the wise virgins. The same call was there. And it's the same call for you and I today. You say, well, I'm, I'm part of this sect. I'm part of that sect. Hey, listen, you better be part of the blood of the lamb, a, a child of God. So uh, who then are they? And who are they especially called to this marriage? This is a feast, right? Well, the first there are those who are so-called as to accept the invitation. That's the first thing you got to do. Accept the invitation. Have you come to Jesus? Are you trusting only in him? Will you have him forever? Uh, does your heart say yes? Uh, uh, then he's yours. There was never any unwillingness in Christ to receive the guilty. No unwillingness to receive you or to receive me. You know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Forget about religion. Forget about church. That All that stuff is nothing without the presence of Almighty God. Even the thief on the cross, Jesus didn't say, today you're going to paradise. No, he said, today you're going to be with me. You see the emphasis? With me in paradise. So will you take him and have him today to be your Lord and Savior? When Abraham's servant wanted to take Rebekah to Isaac, her mother and brother said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? So would I say to you as a young man or woman, I may be addressing today, will you go with this Christ? Will you go with this Lamb of God? Will you put your faith and trust in Him and only Him and make sure doubly for sure? Do you get what Paul said? Doubly. Don't just think it. Make sure, make sure, make sure that you know, you know. 1 John 5, 13. That you may know that you have everlasting life. So has Christ put on uh, His sanctification for you? Has your heart been changed? The Bible says you will know them by their fruits. Is there enough evidence in your life, in my life, that we are really saved by the blood of the Lamb? If not, we need to check into that because the time's running out. The blessings which is ascribed to those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they which are called on the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and, and my days, my days are swifter than a post. They're fleeing by. Uh, we, we almost had a couple of times this last couple of weeks. I almost cratered out and it's about time to leave this world. But whatever it is, God made sure we were brought back and we praise God for that. And I have a different sense of outlook on life, the urgency on life, uh, you know. But think about when, Je when Jesus comes, he's going to put on a show, folks. I mean, we're talking about a God putting on a show for his son. And then you talk about a party of lights. You talk about angels singing and glorifying God. You talk about everything vibrating with the power of his presence. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Are you ready to go see Jesus? Are you ready just to be with him? You know, I'm a firm believer that as we close this out, 
Remember, if you are not blessed, then you are cursed. If you have not found the Jesus of heaven, then you're going to have the eternal damnation of the outer darkness forever. You cannot be left outside the wedding feast. If you have trusted in Jesus, then trust him at once right now. Rest in the lamb who will be your bridegroom and at, at whose marriage supper that you and I shall praise the glory when you look up there and he sees us walking down that aisle heading for that throne where he's at. Man, he's going to glean all over. He's going to say, man, you better hit the strobe lights, buddy. Put the, put the fog on. I mean, we're going to show them. We're going to let the glory of the Lamb of God from the throne just burst out in colors and all. And it's going to be like, oh my gosh, you won't be able to breathe when you see the magnitude when Jesus throws a party. Will you be there? The Bible says make doubly sure. If you're not for sure, then what? it's not going to hurt anything. Why not just go ahead and bow your head? And you might say something like this. Almighty God, I'm not sure. And I want to be doubly sure. So right here, right now, I confess that I'm a sinner before a holy God, the Father. And then we look to the Father and say, Father, forgive us. But he points us to the Son. And the Son says, I paid your sin debt. So we pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart, into my life. Be my Savior. Take me home to be with you when I die. Now, Lord, thank you based on your promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I've called and I'm saved now. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But Father, as I live on this earth and the Holy Spirit begins to come into me, there needs to be a transformation a repentance of sin now because we got saved. We repented to the Father. We trusted in the Son. And now the Holy Spirit says that no man can pluck you from my Father. I and my Father are one. And so the Holy Spirit is going to lock arms and hearts with you. He's going to lead you and guide you so that you can begin to get your life ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Until then, we love you. Thank you all for staying with us and joining us. And I know this was a little bit long, but don't you agree it was worth it? I mean, you better get excited. Jesus, I started to call this, Jesus is about to throw a party. And when he does, you're going to want to be there. All right. But until then, get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Make sure you're ready to go. Make sure your friends are ready to go. Visit our website at L Y I T L. Dot O-R-G. That's love you in the Lord. Dot O-R-G. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. And may you go out and touch hearts for the glory of God. And you can get back with us and say, hey, my best friend just got saved. My boss just got saved. My husband, my wife, my children just got saved. Let us know. Let us know that the seeds that are planting are going to be used for the great harvest that's coming. Until then, God bless you. See you next Sunday, 11 o'clock here on Facebook.